Hello and welcome to Deco Stop from the Deep Sea Podcast. We spend a lot of time gazing at the abyss, and so maybe it's time that the abyss gazed back at us. In these special episodes, we, well, turn things around a little bit and look at the scientists for a more human centric episode. So, on the human side of science for this episode, we're going to celebrate Neurodiversity Celebration Week. And I think that celebration is in the title, is a little bit telling of sort of changing attitudes. We're going to talk about being neurodivergent within science and at sea. And we're going to hear a lot of stories from people's personal experiences. They'll share some coping strategies and we'll talk about the future. This is something I feel able to talk about. Um, this is something I feel part of the community, even though it's incredibly broad. People sort of deal with things a lot more difficult than I have to deal with. But there's also a, a spectrum. You know, there are mild and very severe forms of most of the categories we talk about. So for me personally, I am dyslexic. It's hard to compare, but I would say very, very dyslexic. I didn't use my middle name until well into my 20s because it's Daniel. And I was terrified of writing Danielle and having people make fun of me. So it has impacted my life a great deal. It certainly impacts the way I think and process things. I'm also dyspraxic, which is kind of dyslexia's sporty partner. <laughs> so uh, that lack of coordination spills into moving around in physical space. So I am very clumsy. I have very poor balance. I tend to, to miss things. And so I'm always covered in bruises, basically. And they, they tend to go hand in hand. That That's often seen as part of dyslexia. So it's frustrating because I've always been really into health and I can't play sports. I, <laughs> I can't catch a ball. I fall over really easily. The other issue sort of tied in with all of that is Erlen syndrome or sensitivity syndrome. I think it's actually been, been sort of deregistered now. It's not a, an acknowledged condition, but something neurological when it comes to visual processing. So there is nothing wrong with my eyes sort of focus wise, other than rapidly approaching 40 and all the things that go along with that. But I really struggle to process. And again, that's all tangled up with dyslexia, you know, high contrast on a page really messes with me, uh, flashing light if it catches me off guard. I get lots of leftover images. If I watch someone talking against a, a white wall, if I close my eyes, I can still see them. A camera flash will mess me up for minutes. So it's hard to get me to pose for a picture if you're going to want the flash on. And lots of other sort of visual processing things that is just exhausting and disorientating. And I can't tell where one of these things begins and the other one finishes. You know, maybe, maybe my clumsiness is due to the fact that I can't actually process things visually. I grew up in the late 80s and early 90s, and this wasn't very well understood. And doing this episode, I've realized there's a million times where I could have slipped through the cracks, if not for sort of luck or supportive people. So I had amazing parents who were super, super supportive. People who met me relatively quickly could gauge that actually maybe my test scores didn't quite line up with my ability to hold a conversation. And obviously there was something going wrong here. Um, but in the early days, this was still still just being understood. So right, right now, a, a dyslexia assessment is quite easy. But back then, and this is my hazy child memory, is it was a, a trip to London to the, I think it was called the Dyslexia Institute or something, and it was full-on brainwaves monitoring while I looked at certain things and things like that. So it was quite full-on. And a weird, a weird childhood as a result of that. Like, I'm ultimately grateful because it taught me a lot of the coping skills and it gave me the support that I wouldn't be where I am now without. But strange, I remember a lot of, a lot of sitting on my own outside of rooms while other people talked about me and just sort of catching the odd word. And a Apparently, in a lot of these things that I was sort of being tested for, I was a really good candidate. I was quite articulate. I could explain what was going on. And I guess just the symptoms were very, very strong with me. And so to researchers, that's brilliant. So that's like really nice, clear data. And so I just remember lots of, of failing at things while the people around me were really happy about it, which was really, really strange. So, you know, making me read things or, or, or count squares on this grid that was flickering and giving me headaches and making me actually feel nauseous. And them excitedly saying like, look, look, he's shaking his head. He's trying to, he's trying to clear his vision. He's trying to, oh, look, that's fascinating. And I'm like, oh, I'm right here. Like it was, it was odd. It was an odd way to live your life. Um, but ultimately those led to a lot of support and, you know, the unflappable support of my family that sort of made sure that I got the things that, that needed to be done. But again, these were the early days. Well, we were, we were special learning difficulties back in this day. That's how on PC it was. We, we later became specific learning difficulties. And I think even that doesn't fly now. But back then there'd quite often be a, a temporary 
unit quite often called attached to the schools where people with dyslexia and other issues could be sort of taught differently and that was you know <laughs> that was interesting because you know schools are tough time anyway and i'd say a lot of these folk had troubles well beyond you know a little bit of of schooling difficulties so uh, being in the same special class as the as the people who publicly masturbate or, or bite other people and growl at them doesn't do great wonders for your sort of teenage cred so uh, <laughs> i was a little bit i'd say socially stunned like friendly but like socially stunted uh when i finally sort of rejoined school at, at secondary school and gcse level i hadn't sort of been socialized in the same way that a lot of people do but at the same time i picked up the traits that allowed me to get to where i was at least i, I had been trained in coping strategies the whole erlin syndrome and the and the colored overlays colorimetry is another one that comes in it seems to sit pretty closely with dyslexia as well and that is just getting some relief by having a, like a colored overlay or colored lenses when you're reading and working and the spectrum of this seems to really vary. And like I say, I think currently this is not accepted as a condition. The symptoms are certainly real and measurable, um, but no one's really sure whether this sort of treats the condition. And it's like a prescription. You've got to get this really specific color. And for me, at least when I was young, with the first time I was sort of tested with this, yeah, the overlays helped with my reading. But when I was first given the glasses, which got this really specific tint for me, I cried because I'd never seen things like that. I can remember looking to the corner of the room and I could tell that that corner went away from me. I didn't realize how much of my energy is dedicated to processing and figuring out just what I'm looking at and how often that goes wrong. I still find it amazing that you know other people can just look at things and see them. They don't have to figure them out. But you know, they were really, really dark blue glasses. Again, not a great thing to wear in secondary school. And also that blue actually made me quite depressed. Everything was dark, everything was blue. So even though things looked lovely and clear, it wasn't a very happy way to uh, to see the world. A lot of the visual stuff sort of manifests as, they're not so bad recently, but these really spectacular migraines, getting hospitalized level of migraines. And apparently, <laughs> apparently back when I was getting my brain scanned as a child, one of the offhand comments from the neurologist was that it's like he's having a constant migraine. So I think that was the, that was the visual thing. It's like, I'm always experiencing aura and an overstimulation and then when the migraines do come it's spectacular and pretty debilitating but lots of people have migraines and, and really struggle with them so lots of things just overlap you know lots of things are just part of the human experience and i'm always surprised to see how different other people's perceptions are I think if I was diagnosed by modern standards, I'd probably fall differently. I think a lot of these categories no longer really exist or, or are perceived differently. You know, there's probably some ADHD in there and things like that as well. I know given simple testing, I give a lot of false positives, like I show up as colorblind and I show up as having a lazy eye, but they're all neurological troubles. It, it's just me trying to filter a bad processing system or whatever's going on. So it makes it difficult because I don't know really what normal is, <laughs> if normal is even a valid term. Uh, now that we're becoming more aware of how different we all are. So I'm regularly surprised by people who don't have the same experience as me and what is unusual in, in the way I perceive the world. So they were all a bit tough, strange little backstory, but I thought I would share it. I'm going to try and lay a lot of things bare on this episode because I think that might be helpful and it might be useful to see where I'm coming from. So let's start by chatting with someone who knows me very well as an outside observer. Let's talk with Alan. We've worked together for over 15 years. He's been a hugely supportive boss around these issues. He's someone who I would describe as having a very clear mind. There's a few people I've sort of got to know who I admire for this. He has perfect recall and perfect sort of clarity of thought. And I really sort of covet that because my brain is so noisy. So a lot of the things that I find difficult, he could find frustrating because they're things that I think he finds a lot easier. But instead, he's been been massively patient and massively supportive and I wouldn't have got to where I am without his help. So let's have a chat about how things seem from his side. I suppose we could have a little chat about our working relationship, Alan, because you've been incredibly patient with my interesting foibles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think patience is the right word. I mean, supportive. You'd be very good. I guess when you go back and explain some of this, I mean, do you mind me explaining what happens to you from my point of view? No, that's fascinating because I don't perceive it. Yeah. So I remember we were on a ship somewhere 
I can't remember even when it was now. It must have been Cahir or Falcor or something like that. And it was one of those days where... And this is when you have the proper episode. This is not just difficulty with text or something like that. This is when you have the proper episode. And it was one of those days where someone, I don't know, the captain probably says, like, we shoot everything at 8 o'clock, get everything ready, 8 o'clock, everything goes in the water and we're sort of getting stuff ready and everything else. And you were just being incredibly slow. Like, almost <laughs> like you were trying to delay the whole operation. <laughs> like I was out to sabotage you. Well, you, you know how people do these protests where they just do their job but they do it like mega slowly just to prove a point yeah it was a bit like that and I'm sitting there going what the hell what the hell is wrong with Tom like what you know have I, is it, have I, have I annoyed him or something is it what? I remember sort of saying to you like come on you know we've, we've got like 10 minutes and then uh, at some point I think you just sort of stood up and you said something and, and, and your words were all sort of slurred like you'd been drinking heavily but this was like in the morning <laughs> somewhere with no alcohol and it was just like what the what's going on with this guy and you were like ah oh, blah 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 and then I think you said like I'm just going to have to go and you went and it you know it was a case of swallowing a big pill and sitting in the dark for 20 24 hours and it's like okay so he's got some mad mental migraine thing going on fair enough whatever you know there's always someone else who can help in the operation that's fine yeah so i think member said to you just go and do whatever you need to do and you know sort yourself out first and foremost and then i think after that you sort of explained what was going on and that you don't recognize that you're being slow no my perception follows it my whole brain had slowed down so i i thought everyone else was rushing everyone else seemed really coordinated but i wasn't aware that i was grinding to a halt in front of you <laughs> yeah no, that was the first time and then the, the, the day after it was all better and i think we had a good long chat about it and it was just like whoa i didn't realize that was a thing but we should be aware of that and see the signs and then we we're on another ship probably actually around the same time i remember it seemed to be happening maybe i don't know maybe once a year or something like that there's phases of it happening a lot a Is lot it? more it's sort of yeah yeah like apparently if you if you have one you sort of open up the pathways and like retrain the pathways right. and then you're more likely to have others because remember i think we we're on could have even been someone i can't remember them. and someone came in and said uh what's wrong with tom i'm like i don't know what, what, do, you, what do you mean what's wrong with him and they said oh he's I don't know, he's like slurring his words or something and i was like oh i know what that is <laughs> <laughs> outside right big guy <laughs> so, yeah, off, off the bed off, off you pop yep <laughs> so, it's a light off so yeah it's just i guess if you recognize the more people that can recognize it come in the the better rather than you trying to fight it and staying outside and scorching hot pretending or not pretending but trying to ignore something that's clearly happening that someone just taps you on the shoulder and says nah you're out because <laughs> surely the sooner you deal with it the probably I, mean, I assume the better it is in the long run right or or does it just does it just run through its course regardless or they've changed quite a lot throughout my life yeah i'm always like flaky for like a couple of days afterwards like i have a really hard time like maintaining like trains of thought and so i'm sore and a bit uncoordinated for a few days after but yeah the sooner so that i can sort out the actual event yeah it's usually for the best and yeah they do seem to come in little clusters it seems to be like stress related and they manifest in really really different ways which has been quite fascinating so i had to <laughs> i had to sort of talk friend of the show johanna out of like calling an ambulance once because she thought i was having something quite serious go wrong so sometimes it's uh it's verbal yeah and weirdly i can think and i can type I've, i had one once where all my speech was totally garbled but i could type so i was like typing on an ipad and i had one of these when when i was chatting with johanna and it, like she's getting more and more panicked and it's weird like i know the words in my head but they just get fried on the on the sort of last step so like yeah. one time i remember talking about a filter in a fish tank and i was like oh i, I can't rest right now i really need to sort out this filter in this fish tank but every time i tried to say filter it came out compass yeah so i can remember like johanna getting more and more worried as I'm trying to really calmly explain. Don't be frightened. This okay, I fine will be. Wow. And like, she's like getting more and more worried and like reaching for her mobile phone. Yeah. It's like, oh, how can I tell her that I know what this is? But yeah, weird ones. I had one really bad one where I think, I don't know, it was like ego death. I wasn't a person anymore. It was really weird. It was like instinct. I just existed. Ooh. There's probably people who meditate for their whole lives just to get a glimpse of that, but you just need a like massive migraine. Yeah, I guess it's one of these things where I guess I think I know what signs are there, but only because we've worked together a lot and spent a lot of time at sea together, where you're living in each other's pockets for a long time. But is this something that if you were to go to a new institute and you've got a new crew with you, and on the first day you sit down and say, right, this probably might, might not happen? in the next month but if you see me do this this or this it's okay or, or, or are you hmm. more just wait and see what happens and do with it if it does um i guess i'd probably get it out there i think this is like the most spectacular 
symptom of a load of other things because it is it's totally tied to the dyslexia it's totally tied to the Erlen syndrome or cystoscopic sensitivity syndrome or whatever there's some visual processing thing with me that can get over excited especially in sort of periods of stress and like yeah just it's exhausting but like just just seeing is like a real effort for me and i find it fascinating when i talk to people and they're just like what so you, you can just look at things and you see them you don't have to like figure them out and decode them and try and figure out like well that edge is there and that's closer to me than that and that's in the distance because we've we've joked around a bit about like there's certain things i just can't process yeah <laughs> oh, I, know. I get how you found that so fascinating because I, I went to a, a specialist once and they showed me a pattern that i could not see <laughs> it was really really disorientating it was a certain combination of colors and, and shapes and i just i could not perceive it i could see the paper the paper was in focus yeah but i could not pass the symbols on it which wow. is like some doctor who psychic paper yeah but mine's broken but your, your mind doesn't then try to put something there. It's just literally nothing there. It's not like you're seeing something that isn't there. It's just, it's not trying to desperately fill something in. It tries to pattern match. Right. And so it like flips through this Rolodex of other things it could be. And of course, different parts of the pattern look like different other things. So it looks like those, um, like Google's Deep Dream, like the... Yeah. The neural nets you train, you know, they're always full of dogs' faces and eyes and things like that as it's trying to, like, match things that it knows. Um, it's a bit like that. So I had one... It happens, again, when I'm in environments that I don't know very well. I remember once it was caving, actually, and I saw the back of the person who was leading us and just the environment was so alien, I couldn't pattern match what I was looking at. And so it scrolled through lots of different things and, like, really weird things. Like, once it was a neatly piled load of clothes on the floor, like, nice folded laundry, then it was a tiny little mini cooper car then it was one of those smash robots from the old mashed potato adverts oh. <laughs> and it's just cycling through it like i'm having a waking hallucination as it cycles through all these possible combinations because it just can't recognize what it's seeing you're just pushing the random article button on wiki <laughs> I think so. I think so. Just trying to match things. And that's not a normal human experience. Like that's Because yeah. I, I don't know what's not normal. So you can just look at things and see them. Well, I've never come <laughs> across anyone like this, to be honest. Excellent. Not even speaking personally. It is something quite unique. I mean, we've, you know, we, we, we've worked with other people who are quite heavily dyslexic. But this thing that goes on in your brain is something I don't know. I've never I've worked with anyone with that. It's quite truly spectacular. It's, it's interesting at the same time as being like a little bit frightening and exhausting. Oh, and certain colours can't touch. That's another one. Apparently that's that's a bit of a thing, but like a really rich red and blue, the boundary between them flickers and strobes, like the other one's trying to get on top of the other one. It's like they're fighting, so they look like they're moving and wiggling and shimmering. Wow. There's a lot of shimmering in my vision. Lots yeah. of like, I think I once described it as it's like the scene is projected on a bubbling fluid. The focus is good, but in my brain, it's like it's trying to figure out what's going on. And obviously, there's a lot of noise in the system. Really weird. No wonder I'm so tired. Yeah, your brain's out to get you, mate. <laughs> I wonder, it's probably using more calories than it needs to. That's a good way to lose weight. Something I have, which is not being very linear. And so writing is difficult because that's a linear thing. That's, you know, you yeah. start at the beginning and you go towards the end. And I find that really difficult to write. Like, I remember I think, like, saying to you once with a scientific paper, like, because everything relates to everything else, it isn't a line. I remember sort of describing it as a circle. And it's like, well, where do you get on? Because everything depends on everything else. So where do you start the story? And I had a really hard time teasing that out, whereas you're quite good at, at finding the story to science in order to get it written down. I think I think the way the way you and I have written papers before is if I write the skeleton of it out, the scaffolding of it, if you like, and you come in and do your bits, that works yeah. Very, very efficiently. Whereas I think if you've got a blank sheet of paper in front of you and say, hey, Tom, on you, on you go. When I read it back, I, I have no idea what train of consciousness you're on. <laughs> I know, I, 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 you know, we shouldn't laugh at that. It's not funny, but I, I'm aware of why. It's not because you can't write. It's not because you can't contribute to it. It's just it won't meet the cold, sterile conditions of scientific writing. No, and it, it would probably be legible to another person like me, but that's, yeah. not, that's not the majority of people. So I think it's really good to have these different ways of thinking look over the paper that's why it's always nice even beyond the technical like a load of co-authors is always quite nice because everyone's got a different writing style yeah no but i've also thought the, 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 the way we've done it most efficiently is, is just always sketch out what it what it looks like and then like this is your bit here this is your bit here just what about this bit or try and write it and you rewrite what i've done and then it, it writes itself and it's it's quite easy but it was just recognizing that that's an easier system 
that works for us. I don't think that's even a conscious thing. I think that was just something that developed naturally. You know? I think so. Or maybe through frustration because I take ages if I'm left to my own devices. And you do. You, you do. really kept me on track with like, here is the structure, fill in the blanks. And uh, I do need, unfortunately, like whipping. If you fill in the blanks, you'll do it in a day or two. But if it, were, <laughs> if it was write me the blanks with no place to put them, it would, might take you weeks. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's not a bad thing. That's just recognizing different ways to get the best out of people and how it combination of authors work i think that's teamwork you know just realizing the team's sort of strengths and weaknesses and not just strengths and weaknesses but the bits they hate and the bits they enjoy and you can get them all lined up and yeah trying to do everything yourself is uh is tough especially when there's people around you who like it yeah but i suppose that just builds up over time you know that's we've been working together for a long time there's a lot of understanding that sort of underpins that even though we felt like we came upon it quite naturally it was uh it was just sort of discovered yeah, but then there are things which have come up in your career whilst working for me that I've felt that this has been an issue. And one of those was, I think it was truly commendable that you wrote an entire PhD thesis, given how much you don't like writing or how much of a challenge that is to write such a huge body of work. And uh, one of the examiners, who should remain nameless, was very unsympathetic towards that. And I thought the way they came in and basically tried to change every second word when it didn't make the slightest bit of difference was just, I don't know, that really got to be that. I just thought that was so unnecessary. Really? Yeah, because hardly any of the corrections they were asking to do, all he was doing was making you change the text to make it sound like he wrote it. Yeah, it came right? down to writing style more than yeah, legibility. It, it didn't make it better it, it, when it wasn't wrong. It was just that that's the way he would have written it, and he was writing in a way which is 30 years older than you. And the, the way he went into it in such unbelievable detail, given that if, if that would have been difficult for anybody to take that, just a level of pointless grammatical and structural changes to something that it didn't change the outcome of it, it didn't change the science behind it. But then to do that to someone he already knew was this was quite challenging anyway was just i just think that was really counterproductive in a big way those corrections were rough that was it is weird I, I, i've mentioned this a couple of times i think about the phd like you do the viva and everyone celebrates and then there's this very lonely task of corrections afterwards because everyone everyone thinks you're done and it's just a slog <laughs> you know you've, you've already got it but there's still all this work to be done and we started a new chapter then you know we'd moved down to newcastle we were really excited there was lots going on so it was quite a a time sink to to wade through those and like really like confidence eroding yeah it truly was i mean it was nearly at the point where i was thinking about putting in a complaint and saying this is just this is not helpful and it wouldn't have been helpful to anybody's thesis to to have been altered in in such a way but especially not in your circumstances but i don't know he just decided to do that i thought that was cruel actually very unsympathetic it was a lot of effort he he spent a long time on it it was such a psychological block to open up that document again because it wasn't wasn't worded very nicely so it would just totally erode my drive every time i opened that up and it was like real moments of like well well, maybe i shouldn't be doing this then like not only did i need these corrections but reading my stuff it it seemed at least tonally has made someone quite angry (laughs) so i was just like oh maybe maybe i shouldn't be here yeah well but you did it in the end but i just that that was one of those ones where i just felt that there are times where you should be sympathetic and times where that would have sucked anyway to anybody <laughs> let alone taking someone with sort of major dyslexia and doing that it's just very very unhelpful and as you say that was character crushing thank you though it was nice to i don't know it's nice that that was seen as that was a bit of a rough time am i right in saying you didn't you didn't tell anyone about this when you were at university is that right about being dyslexic yeah i've got a really weird relationship with it and the sort of greatest achievement for me was people not noticing so i have like loads of hidden coping strategies and things like that and it's it's like it was always really nice when people would be like genuinely surprised when i told them it's like ah oh, yes i've fooled you so i i try to keep it quiet i'm from a previous generation i think it's a lot better now they didn't quite know how to sort of pitch the level so i think it was a i think it was at master's level i just let them know and i was weird about like the support i'd get as well like I would take the extra time in exams because I always felt I can just work harder. You know, maybe I can Mm. I can spend a little bit more time. That seems fair. But the 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 sort of score allowances and the and the other sort of support that I could get, I I used to sort of push away from just because I don't know, maybe maybe my own drive and almost Mm. like I have these troubles. They're my things to manage. It's it's no one else's fault. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I shouldn't get a job ahead of someone else. If I can get myself to the same level where I can compete on even playing field then that's fine. I, I, I shouldn't take that spot away from someone else. And I can remember having this really weird feeling where intelligence, there's a lot of like how you brought up and, you know, it's a learned thing, really. You can train 
being smarter. But there is a dice roll when you're born. And that's no more anyone's fault than than this. And I, I remember feeling like I'm so lucky that I'm such a specific type of stupid. I might still get to do what I really want to do. <laughs> and that was like the way I processed it. So I was quite cagey about it initially. And then like I'd go to the, the center where they'd look after us if we, we did have learning. Well, it was learning difficulties at that time. It's been rebranded. And it was weird. Like they'd sit me down and get me a cup of tea. And it's like, oh, Tom, how are you doing? Are you OK today? You know, is everything OK? And I was just like, I'm, I'm here to do a master's in biology. I suppose it was nice to the point of being patronizing. And I didn't like that. Yeah. I was like, the specific things I need help with that you should know about. But yeah. You know, don't don't <laughs> talk to me like I'm a traumatized victim. <laughs> I think they were just trying to make a nice space, but I don't know. I'm very easy to sort of rub the wrong way, I guess. But some people might respond to that. It's just that, you know, there's probably yeah. no one system that works for everybody. And if it didn't work for you, then you find another way of, of coping with it. But you did your whole undergraduate degree without telling the university. I think I might have done an undergrad. I'm sure you told me that once and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, because there was, there was all sorts they could offer. Like there was dictaphones to record the lectures and there was a laptop and things like that. But no, I don't think I did. Again, because I was proving a bit of a point. Yeah. And yet, weird, that, that's another thing that sort of hangs over me a lot. I've got this real sense of I am taking up a spot in this incredible career. Like, this is all I've ever wanted to do. And so I, like, really value it. And I'm very aware that I take up a slot that could be someone else's. You know, someone else could have this job. Someone else could be in this position. And so I've got a weird personal worth element to this. But how does that make any sense? Because you've got an undergrad degree. You've got two master's degrees, right, and a PhD. If anything, you've had to work harder to get more than the average person person than your level at a university right i guess so it depends which way you look at it you've seen yourself as a fraud but actually you're not a fraud it's just that you've had to work harder because you've got other issues going on at the same time that other people don't i guess so but those issues are, are only my problem no but they're still issues nonetheless it doesn't it's not it. science's fault science should do as well as it could possibly do and i'm sort of always aware that maybe there's somebody who'd be doing it better in this position yeah it's a weird feeling. I think I've got a lot of stuff to process with this. Just talk to me, Tom. We'll just record it and then we'll try and sell it. We'll try and monetize your agony. <laughs> So I have quite a complicated relationship with my own issues. And I think maybe calling them issues at all reveals that because that's probably not the, the modern way of thinking. But I've got, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of sort of weird resentment and, and I don't know, self-reflection that's, that's tangled with them. I do have to accept that they are integral to who I am, that if they could be fixed I wouldn't be me anymore. And so there's a like weird self-loathing that comes along with that. But there are new ways of thinking. And so maybe for every weakness, uh, there is also a strength that's being underutilized or underappreciated. So you can have a team of the smartest people in the world, but if they all think the same way, you're not going to have any new ideas. And some recent studies have even argued that it's an advantageous part of, of human diversity to have these different ways of processing that actually makes us stronger as a group. You know, we, we don't exist as individuals. We are a, a team-playing species and we, we work together and you don't have to be everything on your own. You can just provide strengths to part of a greater whole. So some recent studies are arguing that this is a, a becoming a more apparent system of a, of a modern and more artificial world and, and particularly the written word has revealed these weaknesses where maybe us as a species, it, it wasn't really a thing. So as an example, one of the, the ones put forward is that because say when an I write the letter A, it is not automatic. I have to think about the shape of a letter A, I have to turn that into sort of mo fine motor control and I have to draw the letter A. Uh, and that's why dyslexics have famously bad handwriting. It, it's not automatic. You think about every letter, so it makes you slow and it makes you inconsistent. But apparently that makes us very good at spotting inefficiency. When everyone else has made it automatic sort of muscle memory, they don't notice that maybe it's not the best way of doing things. So apparently dyslexics are very good at pointing out that is inefficient and there's a better way of doing things. I haven't found a better way of writing the letter A, by the way. That's just an example. So to get me a little bit more positive and look at this in the modern light where this is all about strengths and weaknesses and, and the difference among folk, who can I talk to who's done loads within deep sea science while also having undiagnosed mental challenges? Well, that would be the legendary Bob Ballard, wouldn't it? I'm really lucky to be joined by Robert Ballard, an American oceanographer, a marine geologist, whose pioneering use of deep diving submersibles has led to some of the key moments in deep sea exploration. Some revolutionary tech he's been involved with is the development of the Alvin 
deep sea submersible and also the development of telepresence which is something we're a big fan of on the show the deep sea isn't a separate place it isn't just for a select few it is for everyone it is our shared heritage and everyone can come along for the ride so we've seen some fantastic improvements uh, with telepresence and and what that's allowing people to do some of his career highlights include being part of the teams that discovered hydrothermal vents in 1977 and the wreck of the titanic in 1985 and more recently he's just published a book called Into the Deep, a memoir of the man who found the Titanic, which was published in 2021. But it wouldn't be the Deep Sea Podcast if we did what people expect. And as a fellow dyslexic, despite that wealth of experience we could dive into, I really want to talk to you about coping, living, succeeding, and actually thriving with dyslexia, as I find your attitude towards it inspiring. And I think when I visit schools, I'm still met with surprise from the next generation of, you know, oh, so I can do this? Yes, yes, you can do this. So I thought we'd give a mouthpiece to that. So thanks so much for giving us some of your time, Bob. My pleasure. And uh, I didn't realize you were a fellow dyslexic. Aren't we lucky? I have really complicated mixed feelings. And I think this show is actually going to help me explore that. I see advantages and I see disadvantages. You have to go down the right road. I think you're right. And I was lucky to go down the right road. I think I'm on the right road. I think I just have to play to my strengths. I have to be humble with the things I find difficult. But let's let's dive right in. So we both sit under the the umbrella of, of dyslexia, but I think it's quite a deeply personal thing and we all experience it quite differently. How does it manifest for you? What are your sort of major strengths and weaknesses? Well, the first place I didn't know I was dyslexic until I was in my 60s when my daughter was diagnosed with it. So it was a discovery to me. But clearly, I, I am dyslexic. I had difficulties reading. But I found my strength is in the right side of my brain. You know, dyslexic brains are physically different the non-dyslexic brains. But the rules of education on how you're supposed to learn were written by non-dyslexics. So they created a comfort zone for them, which was an uncomfortable zone for us. And if you look at human history, it's only fairly recently in the 8,000 generations of Homo sapiens since we walked out of Africa. 8,000 generations, the vast majority of those, except for the last few, was all oral. It was all oral history around the campfire, passing down knowledge. And that's how we function. And so we have a very powerful visualization capability. We see things, we visualize things that that others can't see. You know, I feel like all the fortune tellers were probably dyslexic. All the people (laughs) burnt the stake were probably dyslexic. We see the world very, very differently. And we're lucky in that we can visualize it. So what I did to get around the educational system I had to survive was I I would come back from class and I would type up, I use the word type up because I'm, as you know, 80, and I would type up my notes because I could barely read them if I didn't. And then I would add extra stuff. And so what I did was I would take my notes and I would literally take a photograph of them in my mind. I would literally hold my notes up and take a picture. And I would do that and do that till I fell asleep. And then when I woke up, they were all in my mind. They were all there waiting for my exam. And so I would go in and I'd see the exam question. I'd literally close my eyes and read the answer on my notes. I felt like I was cheating. (laughs) You took your notes in. (laughs) I literally just closed my eyes and read. When I spell a word, I close my eyes and I see the word and then I can spell it. So it's all about this powerful ability of the dyslexic mind to memorize things and take the power of of that capability. But there's a recent research, you know, like I say, I didn't know I was dyslexic, but my daughter was. And I was going to the university. I was driving to give a lecture and I was listening to an interview on our our public radio by two authors, a husband and wife author, Brock and uh, Fernetti, Ide, E-I-D-E, who had written the book, The Dyslexic Advantage. And never in my life did I see those two <laughs> words next to one another. I said, you got to be kidding, dyslexic advantage. And so I went home, I went online, went to Google, had them send me the audio version of the book. <laughs> and I, I put on my headsets and I listened and I listened through the night, tears running down my face for the first time. It was explaining me to me. And I realized I was not alone. I mean, different percentages have been put forward, but somewhere between 15 to 20% of the world are dyslexic. And so I I realized I wasn't alone. And I, uh, most recent research, they have a new revised version of Dyslexic Advantage coming out this year. And in it is new research by 
another researcher by the name of Dr. Helen Taylor. And her thesis is that dyslexics make great explorers because we're used to being outside the box. We don't want to be in the box. I hate being in a city. I want to be out in the outdoors. And that was the outdoor creature I became. So I found that my whole world was being in the outdoors and that we're not afraid of the unknown. My daughter has all these different little quotes from dyslexics, but one of them is, not all who wander are lost. (laughs) And I'm never lost. And I work in a world of complete darkness. Most of the earth is under a world of eternal darkness. 72% of our planet is oceans, and most of it is deep. And I love going underwater because I'm not lost down there. And there's great mountain ranges. So, no, I I just got lucky to move away from pain and move (laughs) towards work. A real amoeba response. You know, I don't like that. I like this. (laughs) Uh, I, I went down this pathway, and here I am today hitting my stride. I feel... After re- reading the book and embracing, I embrace dyslexia. I talk about it openly to everyone, almost in my first sentence. And I just am so lucky to be dyslexic. And I want people to realize the gift you have. But what I do is I dream up things. I'm great at dreaming up things that no one else can dream up. Because I, when I went to college, I quadruple majored in math, physics, chemistry, and geology, loved ancient history. I just went into the supermarket of of knowledge and ate a little of everything. I'm sort of a Swiss army knife. But what I'm able to do is to dream up things that no one else would dream up. And then I get dyslexics and non-dyslexics to do it. (laughs) My wife is my other half. And her joke is that Bob runs around and shakes the coconut trees and we have to catch the coconut before it hits the ground. I just learned how to take this gift My uh, son, Dougie, is also dyslexic and ADHD. And when he was growing up, I put on the mirror uh, when he was brushing his teeth in the morning before he went off to school. And it said, my body is like a race car. And when I learn how to drive it, I'm going to win lots of races. Mm -hmm. So the key is to learn how to drive your car. Yeah. And maybe accepting that the common road is maybe an off-road and... It's not what you're designed for. Your car is bumping and struggling because you're a race car yeah. and you're on a rally track. I, yeah, or you're a long dis- I'm a long distance runner. And I also came up with different techniques for beating everybody. And the idea is, is a lot of people are what we call serial thinkers. They do step one, step two, step three, step four. And I'm a parallel thinker. And I can converge on the spot faster than them because I'm doing all the steps at once and then they converge. That really rings true with me. And it's something I only realized relatively recently. Another way of thinking, too, is is my son, Benjamin, who's not dyslexic, but he loves to sail. And I said, so, son, when you're sailing, how often is the bow of your boat pointed at the finish line? And he said, well, almost never. And so I said, you mean you go over the finish line sideways? And he said, yeah. I said, how do you do? He said, well, you have to tack. And I knew what I was asking. But I said, well, what's tacking? Well, the winds are blowing in a particular direction. And what you're trying to do is get the best reach where you have their sail at the tightest, but it's the closest to your finish line. Not quite there, but the best you got. And you sail on that until you change your tack. And I said, well, why do you change your tack? Well, at some point, the winds are now blowing you away once you get tangential. So you tack back and then you tack and you tack and you tack. And I said, well, that sounds like life. I think the key for me was focusing on accomplishing, to do something. So it didn't matter. I would pick a a destination and that was my finish line. But then I would get up in the morning and I'd say, well, I could do seven things today, but which one's my best tack? towards my finish, then I'll do that. And then I'll change tack and change tack. And then I go over the finish line sideways. So a lot of that is the winds of life blow you not, you never have a following sea. You always have to pick the best wind and the best course you can pick and then go on the next tack. I also found you want to pick a really tough one. (laughs) You want to take on a goal, I think in 15 year increments. If you look at my history in deep submergence, first the submarine, then the ROV, now telepresence, and now we're moving to autonomous where there's no human in the loop at all. Each of those a paradigm shift. So what's the definition of a paradigm? Is when someone tries an idea and it works. And so 
uh, if you study paradigms, you'll notice there's a great book by Professor Sloan at MIT on paradigms. And, and if you plot a paradigm as a function of time and acceptance, you'll, you'll have what are called the early adopters. These are the risk takers, and dyslexics are really good at being risk takers. Uh, 70% of all self-made millionaires and billionaires are dyslexic because they think out of the box. So the very early stages, there's us that are risk takers. Then your idea catches hold. People start to accept it. People were totally against using Alvin when I was promoting it. And then when we used Alvin in Project Famous to throw away the book on play tectonics, everyone wanted to get an Alvin. <laughs> but I was saying, no, no, it's that's old passe. You want to go to underwater vehicle system because Alvin spends most of your time going up and down to the bottom, not much on the bottom. You want to get out of your body and, and move your spirit into a robot. And everyone says, you're nuts. I don't want to do it. And then what you find, though, is the paradigm starts out with few people, rapidly accepts, and then it dies a slow death. But then the next one is like a staircase. It's like yeah. if you study paradigms, you'll find that the one replaced the one was ready to go just as people were accepting it. So most people are out of phase. They're accepting an old paradigm. The old, when I was an Army infantry officer, they always training to fight the last war, not the new war. And so once you realize that you're always going to be in a headwind, you're always going to have people say to you, that's a dumb idea. By the way, the last one wasn't so bad. And I said, well, but you thought that was a dumb idea. <laughs> and so I'm always swimming against the stream. So I accept that. And I feel sorry for them that they are so blind, but I just go ahead and do it anyway. I think I have that as my audiobook. It's uh, the nature of scientific advances or something like that, but it talks about this, this paradigm shift. To, to add a little bit to your, to your tacking analogy, which I think is absolutely spot on, in life, which is far more multi-layered than, than sort of winning a race, and it isn't about winning the race, when you get to that finish line, people may have beaten you there who went in a straight line, but you've been to places they haven't. And when you reach that finish line, which might be a new, a new career path, it might be a new place where you're working as part of a team, you've been places no one's been before, and you've got new skills. Something we talk about when we give people advice on how to, to get into deep sea biology is, is don't, don't just study deep sea biology, because you'll arrive with all the same knowledge as everyone else. Come at it from an angle. Come at it with some, something new to bring to the group. I remember when I was doing the hydrothermal vent cruise, and then we went on to find black smokers, and I, I punched out. I've been in the submarine now for 15 years, and I needed to get tenure. So I went on sabbatical to Stanford, and this is 1979, Silicon Valley was taken off, you know, microprocessors, digital imagery, everything you could imagine. And I just, in my mind, put this like, sort of like when I was a kid, we played potato head, where we'd get a potato and we would put different noses and ears and faces on it. So I basically took all of these pieces and plugged them together and created an image of telepresence that I published in the, the December 1981, 1981, that's 42 years ago, I published my vision of telepresence. And I took my cartoon. If you go to the magazine, National Geographic December, it shows, uh, you'll see it. I showed that cartoon to my MIT engineers, and, and they said, you're nuts. And I said, tell me what law of physics I violated. And they went, well, no, uh, fiber optic sets coming along. Yep. Digital imagery. Yep. That's coming along. Multi-beam. Yeah. The Navy has it still classified, but it'll probably, and they walked through every component <laughs> and said, nope, you didn't break any laws of physics, but it's going to be hard. And I went, gotcha. Yeah. You know, and I have another thing about leading people is that engineers are like an ideal gas. This is the definition of an ideal gas. It can expand to fill any volume, but it can only do work under pressure. <laughs> so I create artificial pressures, like say, I said, well, we're going to go after the Titanic and I want to go down the grand staircase. And so let's start de designing the vehicle. I said, wait a minute, we haven't found the Titanic. Yeah, well, fine. It's, it's there. It's not the Loch Ness Monster. It's there. Let's assume we're going to find the Titanic, but I want to now develop the vehicle that's going to go down the grand staircase. And they said, and what's the time frame? When are we going to get to test the vehicle? Well, on the first dive on the grand staircase. You haven't even found the ship yet. I said, well, I'm going to find it. And then, but I want you to be building the vehicle now to go down the grand staircase. This is you converging on a point. Don't, don't you worry about that. You guys need to come up with the device. 
I'm going to go and work on finding it. Did anyone ever write you off? I have a few points in my life where, uh, I don't know, I, I think because of the way we work, we sometimes rub people up the wrong way. And some people, I, this one gets me a lot, is bad grammar, bad spelling, bad handwriting. You're just written off as stupid. Yeah, people wrote me off as stupid until I could get A's on their damn exams, you know I mean? Uh, they said, how'd you do that? And I said, well, I just did it, didn't I? So I, if you go into my daughter, she was in mathematics and struggling in that. And and uh, I said, could you orally test my daughter? Mm. And they found, oh my God, she knows it all. I said, yeah, orally test her. <laughs> and she then won a top math award in school. So yeah, you just got to you got to realize that that you have to survive the educational system. You have to get your education in spite of it, not because of it. And I think sort of playing to your strengths, like we got a lot of pressure to like, oh, you should you should blog about your research. It's a great way of meeting people. It's a great way of sort of getting your research out there. But oh, writing on top of everything else I had to do, I, I couldn't do it. I tried to start several times and lots of people were telling me this is what you should do. This is a this is a good thing for your career. I got to be where I could write pretty good. Uh, but thank goodness for spell check. But it always gets me when I couldn't even get close enough to spell check it. So what I developed was amazing numbers of anonyms and synonyms that I can <laughs> always find one of them that work. Yeah, it's just coping with uh, what you've got to do. But it's okay. You, you you finally develop the skills. But certainly flipping everything to open dyslexic font helps a lot because there's a font that really frees up our head. I think we're quick to embrace new technology because we see its potential. I'm really aware of, I'm not sure I would have coped in a previous generation. You know, everyone thinks like, oh, Tommy's really into tech. He likes his gadgets. It's like, no, these are my coping strategies. You know, I'm relying on spell check. I've got little things set in my phone just to make life easy. I've got a pin put on the map for people I need to know. I've got a list of people with a little bit of a description so I can remember them because I'm terrible at remembering people. Yeah, my wife wear a name tag for a couple no i'm just kidding but, uh, <laughs> I, I have a sheet of paper of tough words i have a names oh my gosh names forget it <laughs> you know what, where the definition of cutting edge comes from yeah. it's the edge in the forest to which the farmer cut you want to go beyond the cutting edge in the research by dr helen taylor she says that our right lobe is further evolved we are further evolve than non-dyslexics. And we are very comfortable going beyond the cutting edge. Well, we're kind of uncomfortable in the norm, so we might as well have an adventure. Go for it. <laughs> we're not comfortable where everyone else is either. <laughs> here's, the, here's the dark side of the force. I could rattle off famous dyslexics like Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Ted Turner, Steven Spielberg. I'm naming white men. And here's the problem. Uh, we're lucky we're white men. We had the support structure to get us through the game. If you look at, in our country, 70% of high school dropouts are dyslexics of color. If you look at our prison population, it's dominated by dyslexics of color that are entrepreneurs in the wrong business. Mm. So we need to work with other role models who are of color. And I, that's what I'm doing. My job is to, uh, and my ship, the Nautilus. If you go to nautiluslive.org, you will see my ship. It's uh, right now getting ready to go to sea, so it's not live this minute. But when you look at who's on my team, I have every pronoun and every face on my team. It's a rainbow of faces to so that kids can see themselves 20 years out, 10 years out, to know that they can play. Mm. And so it's all about role modeling and involving. And what's really interesting, you know what they call dyslexia? They call it the MIT disease <laughs> because of the dominant number of engineers at MIT that are dyslexic. NASA's engineering team, dominantly dyslexic. So go down those roads. Yeah, the, the spaces are appearing now and there's, there's great seeking of us now. Like it sounds like MIT has got it. The GCHQ, which is the intelligence agency here, famously actively recruits both dyslexics and, and people on the autism spectrum. Because even if you fill a room with intelligent people, if they're the same kind of intelligent people, they're going to have the same ideas. Dyslexics are great at pattern recognition. I thought everyone saw the same thing until <laughs> I, I was really funny about being married to my wife, Barbara, who's definitely a non-dyslexic. 
I would say to her, what do you see? And she'd describe the landscape that, and I'm going, really, that's what you see? And so the way I look at it is you have two eyes. And so you cover one eye when you're born and you see the world through your eye and you form a very heavy opinion about what you see, but your partner is seeing it through the other eye. And neither is correct, but only together can you see in stereo. So you need both eyes. And I don't think the world appreciates what the dyslexic can bring to the game on how they see the world. And then you can see in stereo. Oh, I like that. Well, you know, I also, I'm intense. My wife says, I don't want to be in your brain. It never stops. In fact, that's our power. So you got to tap into what we're so doggone good at and, and let non-dyslexics deal with all that other stuff. Yeah, I'm coming to realize that the, the things I dread, there's someone who loves them. And, you know, you, you form a team and you have complementary skills and it's the same in, in a relationship. It sounds like you guys are quite different. I'm quite different from my partner, but the strengths line up with my weaknesses and, and hopefully vice versa. Like I say, I, I think I'm a lot of work. Hopefully I'm endearing at the same time, but I think I'm a lot of work. No, you, you find your other half and they realize how good you are at a lot of things and they'll dump them on you. <laughs> I, I do a lot of work. I love working at home because I use it as a relief for my mind. Uh, and, and I just pulse back and forth between menial labor where my mind is now thinking. And then I go back. I just try to make sure that in an, in an hour cycle, 40 minutes is work and 20 minutes is is getting myself back under control <laughs> and i just can it, i can sustain that i get hyper focused and time just flies yeah. for me actually it was it was weightlifting i've i've got the dyspraxia as well which is a coordination flavor to dyslexia and lifting a weight that is absolutely at the limit of your ability it takes so much focus and so much coordination of your body it's the it's the only hard reset and it sounds like you've tapped into the same sort of thing i, I just need that hard reset or too many parallel threads you know it's like when you overload a computer you, you've got too many processes running and you'd kind of need a restart i fortunately was in athletics all my life and then when you're when i was i was i was in the military for the army and the navy so i am always in good shape and then i never got out of shape it's discipline i think that's the key because you need to manage your time because when it comes to certain tasks it takes longer than non dyslexic so you just have more time you know it's the tortoise and the hare the hare stops to catch its breath the tortoise just keeps walking and the tortoise wins and you you picked your attacking points along the way but yeah that was always in sight well, what's really nice about a long journey is those tacking times you get to go off and do something different, and then you get back on course. So I think having a, a journey that wanders around, you have a lot of interesting things you bump into, but you know where you want to be. Yeah. And you also know that failure is the greatest teacher you will ever meet. When you get knocked down in life and you're laying on the ground, you got to get up. And what gets you up is your passion. You must have a passion. Don't do what someone else wants you to do. Do what you want to do. And, and that will get you up when you get knocked down. What would be your sort of succinct message for someone neurodivergent with their career ahead of them? Maybe they're sat in school and, uh, and it's crushing them. Embrace your skill sets and don't let anyone tell you you're dumb because you're not. And follow your passion and you'll overcome storms in life come and go and the sun always comes out. And it gets easier the older you get. You can make more choices. You've just got to survive. You've got to leave with the things you need. And then you get to pick your route. Success builds upon success. So pick small targets, hit them, and then lift the bar, lift the bar until you're conquering the most tallest mountain on the planet. Excellent. That's a brilliant thing to end on. Thank you so much for your time. That's an incredible resource you've just shared with us. So thank you so much for that. All righty. Take care. Brilliant to meet you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. I wish I had even close to Bob's confidence and drive. And maybe we should all channel a bit of that. I think I do feel that my issues are a net negative, but I think that I do have different skill sets that I can bring to a team. So I think I can be useful at least. I mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of these 
traits sort of here suddenly in the modern world, leading a lot of people to uh, to sort of attribute them to other external factors and a nice little bit of conspiracy in there as well. But actually, maybe it's that the, the modern world makes these differences from the norm more apparent. I suppose when we create a world for ourselves, we go for the majority. And as the world gets easier and easier for those in the majority, the outliers get a little more apparent and have a harder and harder time. So I reached out to a friend of mine who I used to work with about her experiences working offshore uh, in some less than understanding times. Here's Sarah. Hello. Thank you very much to uh, my friend Tom Lindley, or Dr. Tom as he's now called, for inviting me to speak about my experiences as a neurodivergent person offshore. First of all, you know, it was quite a daunting thing to go work on a ship and, and do a job that pretty much ran against all the um, <laughs> ran against all the kind of things that well, neurodivergent people or people on the autistic spectrum find daunting. Like, you know, we like to have a set routine, we like to know what's going on, but I think ultimately Ultimately, there's certain aspects of our character, our personality, you know, certainly our, uh, our ability to think differently can be quite useful, quite helpful for the day to day. Some of the jobs, some of the jobs that can be quite monotonous to other people, you know, are actually quite reassuring to the neurodivergent person. You know, I found running online sometimes quite monotonous, but sometimes that was quite good because it was it brought the stress levels down and the anxiety levels were kind of low. But certainly when things went wrong or when plans had to be changed, sometimes that was quite a, a bit of a stress and pressure. But however, I think at the end of the day, that gave me the idea and and certainly gave me the belief that what I was doing and how I and how I was able to cope and, and operate within those parameters. It meant that I was actually, you know, I, I came away with the feeling of of having survived it and of having done my best in the circumstances. And I was feeling quite proud of myself, knowing that I could operate in that such a high stress environment. And, you know, and certainly with the sort of like the not the professional aspects of it, but certainly with the aspects of having to of operating and working on ships with people who are more neurotypical. I think that this is where the change in society, how society has changed over the years, is certainly making it a lot better and a lot easier for people who are neurodivergent to operate in, in the offshore world because people are much more aware and are much more educated about these things. You know, I don't have any problems working with young Younger people on the ships and because they they're invariably better educated as to the uh, difficulties and the challenges of living with with autism but sometimes some of the older people uh, who might have got their information or been educated about it from from unreliable sources they they were the harder people to deal with i well i i ne certainly never approached my boss and to tell him that i had asperger's syndrome when i joined my offshore company in 2000 but when i came to join my current job uh, i now work as a civil servant that was one of the first things i told my boss so you know the attitudes are changing and certainly yes i got used to being called and being labeled the weird one on ships but i wouldn't have had it any other way because that's who i am and i refuse to be any anyone else but thank you very much to tom for letting me speak and let me ramble on about my uh, experiences of working offshore whilst autistic and hopefully someone out there might hear it and light bulbs might come on so how can we make the working environment, particularly offshore and the scientific environment, better for neurodivergent folks? It sounds like we have a lot of skills to offer and in the right environment, they can really shine. So how can we move some of the mental load into fitting in? I suppose one of the first steps is a support network and a sense of community. I gave a talk recently at the JNCC, which is a body that gives scientific advice to the UK government. And during that chat, it turned out that they have a support network within their organization. So I hounded Tom after he uh, he confessed his existence and I wanted him to tell me more about it. So even though he's sailing out to sea following a very stressful vessel mobilization, he was good enough to record a little something about his experience. Hi, firstly, um, hi to uh, the digital podcast world and thank you to uh, Tom for inviting me to speak to you. I'm Tom Tangy and have been working in marine conservation at the Joint Nature Conservation Committee or JNCC for the last five years. I've had a few roles in the organisation but I am now a deep sea near the ecologist um, which is my favourite role and suits myself and my neurodivergent traits very well. I'm excited to talk to you about neurodiversity in this sector and as you suspect I am neurodivergent and it has been a struggle and sometimes a battle 
to get to where I am now. So here at JNCC, I looked at setting up a neurodiversity network to raise awareness in the organisation. This was because there was no real awareness and understanding within the organisation before. There was the obvious things of knowing about dyslexia, etc., but not necessarily the other elements and how we can help. So. This network helped provide information, advice, and tools to help neurodiverse colleagues. It's a safe place for all colleagues though, neurodiverse and neurotypical, to come along, as it's so important that this space can be shared, as this helps normalize and raise awareness and understanding in neurotypical colleagues. There are so many strengths that neurodiverse people can bring to organizations. The key is being able to have fluid and open communication about the different ways of working with colleagues that can help tap into our superpowers. These can be sort of finding patterns in data, new processes, etc. Or even uh, some of the things I've done is like off the wall ideas that can be instrumental to organisations in new ways of working because we're able to think differently. Being able to broach simple communication between colleagues and managers in sort of like project groups, etc. can be key for all of us. There is that sort of lack of awareness in the communication that can be a real detriment, not only to organisations themselves, but also to new diverse people. And that can affect mental health, confidence, and even exacerbate neurodiverse traits. I mean, I always think about it like a, a cup that's full or filling up throughout a day. Everything you do in a day, from work life, personal life, phone calls, text messages, anything goes in this cup and it fills it up, fills it up, fills it up. If you're not emptying the cup, everything will then overflow. And when things are overflowing, you'll be in sort of like meltdown mode. So even if it's, just, oh, I must reply to that email, but not do it yet. For myself, I write it on a piece of paper and that means it's out of my cup. And it, it's it's been key for me to be able to understand that. But I only learned this from having some neurodiverse coaching. And I was 38 at the time when I had this uh, coaching and it changed my complete world in uh, how I work, my work streams, productivity, and also in my personal life. So if there is a way for you to be able to tap into these things through work, it can really help you be able to focus and work on other elements and work with other people to help accommodate and understand like the ways of working that will work best for you. So you can say and go with these, and then you can tap into each other and be able to work really productively and proactively together. So, I mean, it's it's amazing if you can. I mean, at JNCC, it's been really great that they acknowledge the need and allow us to set up this neurodiversity network. For anyone out there that's struggling or anything like that, or trying to break into science or marine conservation or anything like that, keep persevering. You will get there. There are things out there to help. It's really been an eye-opener over the last few years to see the neurodiverse umbrella spreading through science, through industry, through academia, and it's gonna help a lot of people, but there still is a lot of work in a lot of areas of raising awareness, but it's just helping raise awareness in whatever way we can. If you can see about setting up a network in your own organization, company, or to help people see about different ways of working and how you might be able to work in different ways with them and it's it can be key so uh, just don't give up you'll get there it's been a pleasure to be able to speak to you thank you again tom for uh, bringing me in on this and for uh, jncc's deep sea literature group who uh, sort of brought this all about so thanks everyone and uh, speak soon it's fantastic that these groups are forming naturally and getting support from the organisations that they're, they're part of. Communication seems to be the first step in what we can do, but what is at the more holistic level? How can we incorporate this way of thinking into workplace culture and actually change the way we operate on a larger scale? Well, at the Challenger Conference last year, the work of Kat Morgan caught my eye. She was discussing just that, how to make the offshore environment more welcoming. So I asked her to share her own experiences, coping strategies, and how we can drive change. I'm joined by Dr. Kat Morgan, who's a postdoctoral researcher associate at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh, who holds a PhD in political science and web science, and her research focuses on the use of digital technologies for political action and communication, particularly by marginalized, excluded, or othered voices. Most recently, Kat has been exploring disability-inclusive careers and is interested in how technology can improve the workplace. Thanks so much for coming on for a chat, Kat. 
Hiya, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this is good fun. This is good fun. So some different topics. This isn't universally deep sea, but I think this is some important stuff to, to broach. So I am horribly oversharing on this episode because I feel it's important <laughs> and I will make myself a little bit vulnerable for uh, for sort of camaraderie with uh, everyone who might be secretly feeling these ways. So if you're if happy to share, like, what are your personal quirks, Kat? How, how, do you, how do you sort of feel you interact with life maybe a little bit differently? That's a really interesting question. You know, it made me think about quirks. What are my quirks? You know, because as you say, it's such a personal kind of experience. I think they are very much guided by my my neurodivergence because I, I had actually diagnosed with quite late in life during my first master's. And my professor just said when she was reading my essay, are you sure you're not dyslexic? Because, you know, you kind of talk around a subject, but you don't really make your point. And you kind of assume that people know this information, but it's not quite there. So yeah, finding out I was dyslexic, dyspraxic, dyscalculic, and had visual stress kind of changed my perspective on things, learning, teaching, life. So suddenly I was like, oh, is that why I walk into things and get bruises that I don't remember, you know, getting? And is that why I prefer reading older books because the pages are yellow rather than brand spanking new white ones, you know? So it was really powerful to kind of have that diagnosis and to have that kind of knowledge about what makes me different and how I see the world. So I think my, my quirks are kind of tied into to that, you know, how I kind of physically experience things and why I prefer like written down information or if I'm taking notes, why I'll then write them out again so that I can actually understand them because my handwriting is so appalling. <laughs> or, you know, like when you're in this really amazing lecture or workshop and someone's like given some really powerful visual examples and you're just like singing because it's so amazing and you know you're really excited and you know you want to do these things yourself because it's just a different way of of understanding and seeing and and learning at the same time so I think they're deeply wrapped up in how I see the world and how I experience knowledge I think I I felt the sort of same way there was all these there's all these things I just assumed were part of my personality and I, I was diagnosed quite early on but there's much more of a sense of community now particularly online and weird little subtle things like a there was a dyspraxia group on I'm a member of actually on Reddit and they were talking about how they hate eating in front of other people mm. and I was like I just thought I didn't like that I didn't realize that this is this is like a trait and then it made sort of perfect sense you know we're uncoordinated we're clumsy there's a story I tell about having a wonderful day out after I've been offshore for a long time and I'm like clingy for social interaction after I've been offshore for a long time I'm extra friendly and I'm extra chatty to everyone I talk to and then I get home and there is like visible beans on my face there's like <laughs> like half a baked bean and so and I was just like oh and it, it's such a social thing it's such a, a way that we as humans sort of bond you know sharing food together is really symbolic but I really don't like it I really you know I'm a, I'm a terrible one for like oh let's watch in front of the tv yeah. hiding the fact that I can't eat if you're watching me eat <laughs> because the more I think about it the more clumsy I am <laughs> yeah and it's and it's a real stressful thing and because it's you know you get those things that are tied into academia the kind of drinks and whatever nibbles stuff conferences and whatnot and I'm one of those people that gets my food and goes off into a corner you know because I'm like don't look at me eat or if someone's talking to me while I'm eating a sandwich I'm like literally on the edge of my seat with anxiety I'm like oh my god don't don't look at me oh god the conference thing yeah. where you've got a little flimsy paper plate and you've sort of balanced your food on it and people are talking to you and people are milling around and you've got all this peripheral vision stuff going on because you're trying to navigate this space you've probably got a coffee in the other hand so you're just like actually how do I eat this both of my hands are full <laughs> and, and people are talking to you about your whole career yeah <laughs> it's quite it's quite stressful and they're like well tell me about your research you're like oh my god really I just want to have my sandwich you know it's, I saw this fantastic thing on Twitter where there were these different color badges where you could wear them at a conference and it was like red yellow green you know do come talk to me don't talk to me when I'm socializing blah 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 don't you know kind of I'm yes I'm a hugger and I said I want black <laughs> the one that said I'm neurodivergent don't talk to me when I'm eating don't talk to me in the bathroom I will approach you there should be the option to say yes I want to network but on my own terms yeah you know? I think I need like a t-shirt which is just like weird but nice like, <laughs> like don't be offended I love that. <laughs> yeah I want one that says I can be blunt I don't you know I don't mean anything by it it's just how I talk yeah it's weird because the podcast has like pushed me into a real uncomfortable space which I think has actually been really good for me it's been like there's a there's an element of avoiding things you can't do and there's an element of like running towards them for the practice i find people amazing but they terrify me and that's just it like i've got this such a push pull like i want to talk to everyone because everyone's got these interesting stories and everyone's got this other take but at the same time it's exhausting please leave me alone i need to be in yeah. a quiet space you know i think as long as you 
sometimes that's a quiet space. I mean, I think that about conferences as well. But sometimes when you're you've got a day full of meetings, I just want to schedule like a ten minute break or go somewhere else and just have a quiet ten minutes to gather my thoughts and you know just have that non interaction so that I can gather myself to again go into another one because you need that downtime mm. to kind of pause and reflect, but also to kind of reclaim yourself and just go. Well, that was really stressful talking to these people. It just seems so irrational. But yeah, I think knowing that I'm neurodivergent and speaking to some of my colleagues who are doing you know work on um, inequalities and neurodivergence in the workplace has been so powerful. And having someone else, my um, colleague actually Clay, I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning him. He's amazing, and he's got ADHD and we talk all the time and just finding these amazing similarities and like find as you say finding that community has been really really powerful yeah it's fantastic I'm, I'm liking this sort of galvanization and this mobilization and, and like we're talking about it now quite quite publicly yeah we've touched upon the, some of the things we find difficult do you think there's a flip side to this what what are your strengths what are your sort of superpowers on the other side of this coin it's interesting because because in the research so many people said in a project i was doing people say that i've got superpowers when they talk <laughs> about neurodivergence and you know i thought well, well do i because you know people people talk about these, this amazing ability to focus and yeah during my phd I, I kind of had those moments where you are so micro focused on what you're doing and in the the kind of argument you're in that literature you know you're listening to some music so you've got like some white noise behind you and then someone tries to talk to you but you're just like oh my god now is so not the time but you know when you have that amazing micro focus I feel like you're kind of on this amazing level of superpower academia you know you're you're writing you're understanding everything and you're in your own little kind of world um, I think it's very different now being a postdoc and you know kind of those those moments are quite rare because you're, you're doing so many other things and talking to people and you've got you know fingers in many pies in terms of projects you know you're in and out and you don't have that kind of deep focus ability because you know writing a thesis is very different from the rest of the work but I think also being super organized like I cannot not schedule meetings with an hour reminder half an hour reminder and a 10 minute one because all of my meetings are like that otherwise I wouldn't turn up on time <laughs> to the point where I am now obsessively early for everything yeah, you have to sort of tick these additional worries off to clear the landscape for you to actually focus on what, what you're there to do. You know, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be worrying about, oh, but there might be traffic or there's this software sometimes bugs out and things like that. I need to tick those off or I won't be I won't be sort of present for the thing we're trying to do. And, and I, I'm the other way. I tend to sort of run late and I'm, I like an efficient day and I like an efficient path to the day. Mm. So I'll try and I'll try and cram everything in. And then one thing will take a little bit longer. I don't I don't put enough contingency in so one thing will take a little bit longer and the whole like cascade falls down and i'm not present for any of the things i'm doing because i'm already worrying about the next thing which i'm now late for it, i had like a, a nice little workshop where i was sort of sharing this of just not being present for anything on this day because something had gone wrong right at the beginning and it took a little bit longer than i thought and and this whole domino effect happened and i just i wasn't giving people time and, and focus because i was so worried about the next thing and, and just trying to manage that a little bit better it's so easy to do and um i've started if i'm having a, a meeting i will just minimize everything and be like right i am in this meeting do not check your email mm -hmm. you know don't don't look at the notifications just be present and i've actually got a post-it note <laughs> above my screen where my camera is to remind me not only to look at the camera when I'm talking to people but to try and be present in that moment yeah because those anxieties those stresses can really kind of derail you almost and I think it's less important for, for teams meetings because everyone is distracted but I think people can tell when we're not focused on them and that's quite important when you're doing research I think we're just not so good at hiding it I think that's the thing I think yeah. I, I work with some amazing people who are obviously just like wired so differently from me and I feel anxious looking at the way they work, the way they fly from one meeting and one project into the next one. You know, they make fun of me for even wanting a screen. I was like, can I buy you a screen? You just work on your laptop. It's like, no, no, fine, laptop's enough. And it's just like, no, it's like screens, screens. It's not even about visual real estate. It's about I put something in this screen and I put something in this screen yeah. and I've got the space organized. And I, I look at them in wonder. Oh my God, I do that too. I'm a fidget as well. Like I realize that I do it on Teams because I can see myself <laughs> the only person in a meeting constantly 
constantly moving around and I've got like a tangle toy and something else and like pens and stuff because I think well I'm gonna sit here for half an hour try not to move around too much but you know people might my colleagues used to it now so well that's a lot of it like just being part of a team and people regularly working with you you know hopefully my little foibles they see as you know a price to be paid for hopefully the good stuff as well (laughs) yeah absolutely and I think you know like you say it's it's so core to who you are and it's one of those things where you think well you know we we just get used to so many different other things and the way people talk and the way they behave and I think well they can get used to me because I'm not that different just a little bit quirky yeah and and fully willing to meet people halfway yeah like realizing that I'm I'm really really aware that I am hard work the closer you get to me the, the the closer you get to the sort of inner circle where I might actually show you how many things I have trouble with but the people who get into that inner circle I'm so aware that I'm just I must be exhausting I must be really hard work (laughs) oh yeah I know I'm high maintenance that's why I have like a core circle of people rather than like you know a huge amount I'm like no just just a small group because you know I don't want to inflict myself on too many people but because we're having these conversations all the time I think it's it's really helping to be able to say to our colleagues and say you know if you go to a conference can we not have white slides with Times New Roman as a standard because I can't read that Maybe that's it. Maybe as as things are getting better, that circle of trust will erode and get a little bit bigger. Because essentially, I think we've been hiding ourselves in order to fit in and leaning very heavily on a small circle of trusted people who can sort of help us fill in the gaps. Mm. But as the sort of acceptance and just understanding seems to be spreading like wildfire right now, there's still lots to be done, but it's getting so, so good. I think people in this community are feeling much more sort of seen and engaging and can maybe express themselves a little bit better because they're not doing this actor filter which is how it sort of felt for me and and then it takes a a huge amount of sort of mental resources to hide things I really struggle with Mm. because I feel really vulnerable if people see that absolutely and I think the more we see things like the more we see things being introduced to make the workplace more inclusive in general not just for neurodivergent colleagues and myself but you know everyone to make it more inclusive for everyone but it kind of makes it so that universities research innovation and science careers everywhere are more inclusive and more accepting so I think yeah that community is getting broader all the time and I do think some things will filter through slowly but managing knowledge for example educational managers I think is really important because you know when you say to someone I need help they don't necessarily understand what kind of help you need although sometimes we don't understand what help we need but I think being able to say, well, you know, this is what I need and you're the person who needs to get it for me is really, really powerful. And they may not know that. And that that's, you know, a really good conversation to have. But being able to kind of train people so they've already got knowledge, you're not the one who's then educating them as well, takes the kind of responsibility off you so that your one moment of saying I need help is the biggest and only thing that you have to do. And then the community's already kind of got your back because all the management knows what their responsibilities are and they've got that information to help you. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's across the board. This is just a symptom that we've noticed within our own demographic, but hopefully is being reflected across. And it, there's a lot to learn there's lots of new words there's lots of new ways of thinking and there's that's difficult there's always a little bit of pushback and things like that but the rewards are huge like Mm. when people are are happy and comfortable and not putting on a pretense like they just thrive and are just enjoyable to be around you know all all the same things that are just like oh there's all these things i've got to learn now is part of like the enjoyment of the variety of humanity It, it can be seen as like wow i didn't know that that's really interesting and then you know you've got these bridges these these new interactions and you're talking to people a decade ago you wouldn't have been able to talk to because you weren't communicating sort of well so you're right it's it's across the board which is bang on what your sort of research is focused on yes it's an exciting time actually to be doing research on this and to have funders as well as the government and you know universities who are willing to listen i think that that really really helps i think we've talked about how sort of ingrained these are with our personality Mm -hmm. which is weird because I I just have this weird fantasy of flipping a switch and being able to see things how other people do I I, I think you mentioned visual fatigue as well you know it's it's one of those things that you know when you get that really big diagnosis that everyone starts talking about what you know these labels it just says visual stress and I think one of one of the things that I've noticed is that I have this kind of almost like a attention deficit and it, I don't know whether it is ADHD who knows but you know where where you kind of find your inability to kind of stare at screens for huge amounts of time and the brightness of things I have to turn everything down like massively so that I'm not staring at like you know essentially blue light 
because mm. it makes me really stressed and overworked really, really, really quickly. So everything's on about sort of 40 percent and and going into a new environment and having to reset everything is, is quite an easy fix. And I've got all these um, eye protection things on my phone and on my computer. I've got this thing called Flux. Oh, I love it. Ah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Mm. Fantastic. And it and it's an orange overlay for me anyway, which is brilliant for my dyslexia because that's my colour. So that really helps. But, um, you know, I change all of my Microsoft Word, everything so that it's got a black background, which really helps with visual stress so that you're not constantly boring into this kind of black <laughs> dots on the screen. So that just seems to be part of my dyslexia that I just, I don't have that thing where the text goes in and out, but it just, it's searingly bright against the white background. So that has really, really helped me understand why I kind of get fatigued really really quickly yeah everyone sort of looks at me as like uh, oh you know Tom is really into his tech it is a a house of cards of coping strategies Mm. I'm really aware that maybe I'm the first generation who can sort of succeed in the way I have because this assistive technology is quite new and people wild like us in the in the past would have just struggled and and not made it yeah I wonder because I do think technology has has helped a phenomenal amount. Like we do have so many sort of assistive technologies that allow us to cope and make life better. And, you know, there are real innovations coming that I think are going to really help to do with neuro- neurodivergence and research in general. Yeah, I do think that there are so many people who either relied on other people or, you know, had very different coping mechanisms but kind of made it to some degree or like you say just didn't make it so whether that's you know in research or innovation but you you do see these old theses with kind of credit saying and thanks to my wife for writing this up for Mm. me and helping me with my analysis and I wonder whether that was more to do with having that person there to kind of second guess something I see this in this research is that what you see like you're almost checking in within that inner circle and saying you know what do you think this is what I think you know can you write this all up for me because that would have been so stressful using that typewriter as a laborious process but also that noise probably would have been too much that's a really good observation. The The inner circle was still there. People were, were hiding and there was a network of people who allowed them to succeed. Yeah, I just wonder whether that was there or whether, you know, whether, like you say, whether people didn't make it as much. Like there was this really famous thing announced a couple of years ago. I can't remember what his name is, but he was very, very senior in the Navy. He was a retiring naval equivalent general. And he said, well, I'm dyslexic. And now that I'm retiring, I can say this, but I've never told anyone. And I just thought, wow, what what did he have to do to be able to kind of be promoted and be such a powerful person in his career, but then not tell anyone, you know, what were his coping mechanisms? But there must have been so much concealing it, so much of like delegating mm. jobs and like, well, what, why isn't he doing that? Yeah. Well, he's so powerful now. So I, that's yeah. why he doesn't do any handwritten reports, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, I just, I wonder how many people weren't able to succeed which is a real shame. But at the same time, I'm thinking, wow, how brilliant are we now that we have these innovations to support people in a different way? Yeah, and I think, you know, having grown up reading all the sci-fi, you know, sci-fi has taught us so much about what could go wrong, (laughs) you know, getting far too involved in living online rather than living in real life. And um, I think some of the shift that we did with our work during the pandemic it had to happen really really quickly so suddenly everyone had to shift online in a way that they hadn't before and had to learn new programs like teams which have become such a feature and I think at the same time we learn to create some sort of separation yeah absolutely and I've, I see the, the swing really because we've all felt this and I, I, I think a lot of the things we discuss are actually common to everyone. I think it's just turned up to 11 with us. But I think a lot of mm. the, the things we struggle with are fairly universal. But yeah, we, we started to push back. And I'm loving these these email handles, with, which end with, you know, I may reply outside of work hours. Do not feel you have to yeah. do the same. And I was like, oh, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And when I set that up, I was like, right, because someone sent me an email with the email charter. And I'd never heard of that before. And I read it and I thought, yes, I agree with this. Yeah, and that's now part of my signature and I sort of say you know don't don't feel like you have to share personal information blah, blah, blah. and I love that and I love that people are using their pronouns and people are getting more comfortable and saying you know on their social media you know I'm dyslexic or you know don't be offended if I'm blunt in my emails or something like that where they're able to say you know this is just 
how I reply or this is me. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, there's a lot more honesty and, and transparency. And I'm I'm liking that we and across loads of loads of different demographics, we are maybe not hiding so much and the true variety of humanity is now more visible. And I'm enjoying that. Yeah. Because people are fascinating and the more they get to be people, the better. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree so much. And I think it's great that we've got more language to be able to talk about these things you know like bef- beforehand we wouldn't have necessarily have used the sort of labels that we're talking about you know when we talk about neurodivergence or you know people who would have you know said something about conditions or curing or managing whereas now I think if we're looking at the social model of um, disability you know it's it's about making the workplace less disabling for people rather than changing the person or changing the environment which I think is really powerful yeah and we're, we're seeing such improvement But also I think um, having a really knowledgeable, supportive manager or principal investigator, I mean, you can't really succeed without someone in your corner who knows you and your foibles and knows how you work. And I think that's that's really, really powerful because I'm really lucky and I have a really good manager. And my colleague said one of the things that he really needs is when you set a task of work, what is it you need to do, when you need to do it by and what you need it to look like? And I just thought, oh my God, that's really simple fix. And I think I need that too. It's brilliant because now that's how she'll talk to everybody. Or if you turn up to a meeting, one of the project findings we were talking about was people get really anxious about going to meetings when they don't know what they're about. If someone puts you on the spot and says, oh, Kat, can you talk about that thing, you know, part of the project? I will literally be frozen for a few seconds thinking, oh my God, someone needs me to talk about something. I didn't know we were talking about something today. You know, but just knowing <laughs> that that's on, on the topic just three items on the agenda that's brilliant because then you, you go into that meeting prepared yeah you, you've got to flip into the sort of right gear because if something catches me off guard or a piece of information is not what i expected i know i'm doing it and i can't train myself not to i will just stare at the person wide-eyed while i try and process that <laughs> yes oh my god that's it and that combined with some poor spelling maybe some poor grammar certain folk really write me off early on do you know, that's so true. And it really irks me that people correct each other in, in a kind of stressful way on social media. One of my favourite technologies for that actually is Grammarly. Yes. Oh, my God. It's such a fantastic software because it will just come along and say, did you mean to say that thing? What, what, what was the point of your email? Because it's now buried. Would you like to change that around? And I'm like, thank you, Grammarly. And I'm terrible at making my point in emails. So it's fantastic just having that software make suggestions so that you don't have to write something five times before you send it. Are there any more assistive technologies you want to give a shout out for? I absolutely love Otter. Otter.ai. Oh. Well, you can you can use it for a various number of things, but it's a tool where it records your voice, but then it spits out a transcript. I used it a lot during my PhD to just kind of record meetings between me and my supervisors. And when you're out walking, you know, because you've, you've taken a break and you think, oh God, I can't look at the screen for another minute, but I've got it on my phone. So it's really useful for just talking into and making sense of your thoughts. Because I find um, writing things down laborious and sometimes you're trying to text it to yourself or send yourself an email and it takes too long and then the thought's gone. And it, it learns as you talk. So it gets to know your accent and you know some of the regional slang or you know the words. It basically understands what you're saying and you can edit your transcripts on the site. And it's fantastic because obviously the more you edit, the more it understands how you talk. So if you're in a meeting, you can plug it into Zoom and it just does it for you. That's brilliant. Oh, that's a good one. A few more just for assistive technology. Screen readers, the best I've found so far is actually the one included in Microsoft Edge. And it seems to handle scientific papers quite well. So that's that's one I sort of recommend. And actually, I've, I've turned a few long texts into audiobooks by just setting it reading and then using the podcast recording software to just capture the stream so i've left my computer on overnight recording like a whole book and maybe that's illegal i don't know i'm not sharing it but yeah so i I basically turn turn whole books into an audiobook that's great that's super helpful that is fantastic what what a brilliant thing to do i love that that you can have because yes you get the pdf readers and they're not quite human are they so yeah i've copied and pasted a paper or a book chapter into words so I can have something like Clara Reed to read it back to me because their accents and their, their people are real. Yours might be better. So that's Clara Reed. Clara Reed, yeah, it's brilliant. I'll, I'll try and gather all this up and like put it in the in the show notes. Bob Ballard brought up uh, the open dyslexia font as well. I'm not sure it works for me. 
Yeah, I don't use it myself. I think any of the serif fonts, I know people swear by Arial, but I find that quite stressful. I like Calibri. It's soft, it's smaller. Vidana, that's a nice one. Anything that is not Times New Roman, basically, I just yeah. hate that font. It just makes makes everything go boggly. Yeah, harsh lines and, and lots of contrast. A weird little tip that I came across that then made, made so much sense. If you're buying an e-reader, buy the white version. And I, I always go immediately for black electronics, but then you've got a black border against your white. You've got a harsh line there. And actually, the white electronics are far less stressful if you're looking at the page. It made so much sense as soon as I heard that. How interesting. I found that the writing things with pencils is also less stressful than pens because when I'm writing things with pens, the ink bleeds and then I you know, smear things across the page and then I can't read what I'm writing. So I started using those kind of pencils that you twist that have quite a hard graphite in them. And I just find my, my writing so much more legible now. Or Sharpies, that's a brilliant way to get around things. I like the pencils because you can give emphasis. If I'm not sure of something, I can like not push very hard. And if I want to emphasize something, I push a little bit harder. So there's an extra layer of communication in there. Oh, I love that. Is there anything you think's on the on the horizon for assistive technology? Well, at Heriot Watt, there's this department called the Robotarium. Wow. And yeah, <laughs> they are really on like the cusp of, a, of amazing innovation. And there's this really cool assistive technology that my boss is working with, actually, where if you're, you know, for example, you're working from home for whatever reason, you may be on long term sick, for example, there's a robot screen kind of gets wheeled into the meeting and you have a seat at a table so you are literally in the room your face is on the screen like you're in teams you've got a microphone you are literally in the meeting and able to turn and look at other people as if you're in the meeting without having to go in and face all of that stress and someone else is literally kind of staring at something that's at the same eye line as you and I think that would be really powerful for people who have care responsibilities or long-term sick or you know just prefer working from home but there's there's so many innovations in terms of the internet of things when you've got different tools whereby you can make a cup of tea and it then makes a glass of wine appear in your colleague's home in Japan because you're on different <laughs> different working times but you know you want to work on a, a paper together but you know you're kind of like chatting to each other but you know you're kind of cheersing each other at the same time so I think yeah there are there are some really powerful things coming watch what different universities and innovation sites are doing I suppose on its surface you're just like oh well, that seems a lot of work but at the same time when your face is on a laptop people see you as a laptop you are a piece of software <laughs> and you're not you don't have an equal seat at the table and it's it's very, very different being able to kind of feel like you're represented in that room. We've also got like, you know, virtual reality, as you say, where, you know, you can map the workspace and highlight things that aren't inclusive. So managers can really understand how neurodivergent colleagues experience the world, you know, where you can go into a really loud meeting room without sandboarding and say, and this is why we find this really stressful, you know, or a shared, shared office with 50 people, you know, rather than pointing out things that are creating accessibility, pointing out things that aren't as well, so that, you know, managers have that knowledge and understanding but they can experience it by walking around in that in that environment. I think that's very powerful as well. And that's something that Harriet Watt are doing too. Oh, brilliant. Narrowing in on, on science a little bit, are there any specifics to, say, the offshore environments and, and academia? Are there any elements we need to be more aware of? I'm seeing sort of brilliant progress, but certainly the offshore environment, by its necessity, it is a difficult environment. You know, the constant noise, the constant motion, it's a constant distraction for me because I have to put quite a lot of effort into balancing. And so it's, it's a tough environment are any thoughts on on how we can make that more accessible to people or, or is it just communication is it just honesty i think communication is very very important but i do think some of the things that we could do was highlighted in our research actually by making things that you wear more inclusive and accessible and equal actually because i think it's caroline criado perez wrote a book about safety features you know whether it's hard hats or life preservers and gloves and you know even PPE that isn't necessarily made for the people who wear it so you have things that fit a six foot man which may be very different for a woman but equally you have material that can be extremely stressful and anxious to someone who's neurodivergent so whether it's wearing a, a life preserver or a, a PPE or a lab coat you know really thinking about what things are made out of and how it can be experienced I think is very very important and trying to make something that is accessible and less anxiety inducing in terms of material and flammability and all that kind of stuff taken into account with safety but I also think if these environments you know are where people are going whether it's we're going out in, in the middle of the ocean taking samples there needs to be a quiet space whether it's 
putting on sound cancelling headphones or a quiet room where you can go which is soundboarded you know and it can be a bathroom cubicle size you know where you can just go in and gather yourself because everybody needs that whether you need to do meditation or you want to talk to somebody on the phone without all that background noise or you just need that moment to kind of go where drilling isn't happening and people aren't constantly moving around you And I think that would apply to so many situations, whether it's conferences or the workspace or even working from home where you just need quiet just for a few minutes a day. Yeah, it's a tiny amount of space to sacrifice. And even if it sounds, you know, I'm sure the people listening are just like, oh, that's so indulgent, but you'll get so much more from people. It's such a stressful environment offshore and just having a little bit of recharge space. And actually this this came up in our guide for people going offshore for the first time is like, be there for people if they look like they might need help or to talk to, but at the same time, don't pursue them. Yes. Let them go and have a little bit of quiet time. And I would have the most horrible cabin in the world to myself over a shared cabin. I, I'm not a fan of sort of a shared space, but then there's, there's reinforcing the social social etiquette on the vessel it's just like well you're in opposite shifts and at this time that room belongs to that other person so i'm sorry you forgot your phone charger but it's not your cabin right now and so you're just gonna have to leave them be and you know as you get to know each other and those boundaries sort of break down then it becomes a little bit easier yeah Oh, we went all over the place there, but I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really, really good. It was really nice to chat to, to you about all of these amazing things, like a really good kind of melting pot of loads of ideas. It, it's going to be the conclusion of the show and will hopefully lead on to other shows. But because it's sort of neurodivergency feels like an area I'm in and I can talk to about, then I can be quite open and vulnerable on the show as a kicking off to, as you pointed out, this isn't actually a neurodivergency thing. This is about accepting different people and making a welcoming environment for different people and enjoying how different people are and not getting annoyed if they don't fit in your box (laughs) yeah absolutely i remember like a a meme where someone's hammering the square into the circle and i feel like that's what we're like (laughs) thanks so much for your time kat i really enjoyed that you too it was lovely chatting to you tom We're going to share some of Kat's resources in the show notes. Uh, I really like that she was going immediately after our talk to talk with one of the big unions here in the UK who had actually approached her on how to support their neurodivergent members because they're aware that this is a new frontier, this is an area that needs a great deal of change and an area where a workers' union could provide that larger organised power to make some changes. So being a little bit older than a few of the people I've spoken to, I'm aware that I I don't think the world has ever been so kind. I know it doesn't feel that way, but I do see rapid improvements in these spaces and feeling a lot more seen. I think a lot of things we brought up, you know, people might say, oh, that's just part of being human. And I think it's all a a spectrum. The the difficulty someone with ADHD faces can be similar to somebody who's neurotypical. And it's more a degree of how much that impacts that individual's life, where it becomes just from a little character trait into something quite harmful that they, they need help with. But that's all the more reason to, for one, seek empathy, because these are quite understandable things. They're just turned up to 11 in some people. But at the same time, everyone might benefit from these changes. We've maybe gone a bit too efficient. We've maybe streamlined our lives a little bit too much. And maybe there are lots of people who would like a quiet room in the office where they can just have 10 minutes to gather their thoughts. These aren't unique to people with neurodivergent traits. These are something maybe we could all benefit from. So by making some of these changes, I do feel that no one loses out. I I do feel like these are things that will make our working environments and where we live our lives really more enjoyable to everyone. Bob brought up the intersectionality a lot and how this is part of a few wider issues, really. The words and themes that came up in this episode, you know, talk about the mental load of appearing to blend in, of operating in a world that wasn't optimized for you, that the fear of repercussions, if you pointed out something that, that wasn't working for you and asked power to make changes. The language sounded very similar to what we hear in, in many other sort of othered voices. I felt like this was a topic that I could speak on because it is my personal experience, but there There are many other specific topics that we probably do need to cover on these episodes and we'll look at broaching those down the line. But I think the similarities are undeniable. So it's all part of just making a wider and more caring environment that we can all operate in. We're going to put loads of resources into the show notes, anything that we've brought up. 
this is a one-off episode, but so many people who I've mentioned it to already have shared stories. So I'd love to galvanize a little bit of a community around this episode. Please do tweet, share your stories with us. Maybe we'll try and generate a little bit of a hashtag to go with the Neurodivergency Celebration Week. And we'll see if we can get some momentum. I'd love a wider network of marine scientists sort of working this space. So I'll just close by saying, despite all the online fighting, these are are kinder and more understanding times and things are rapidly moving. Be patient and understanding with each other. Improvement rarely feels like winning. It often feels like patience and compromise and understanding. It is brought by working together. I do think that these changes are going to be advantageous to to everyone. And that's it. That's my thoughts on this one. So I know these are a little bit of a weird one. I don't think this one touched on deep sea science much at all. But that's the point of the decaf stop. It is a more human look at the human side of science. Thanks for listening to this episode. Until the next one, I'll deep see you next time. And I abyss you already. <laughs>